Okay, well, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Bill Travis, and I'm a photo-based artist. One of the unusual things about this series, I think, is that it features one photographer interviewing another, or in this case, two other photographers. This is the third of four interviews with some of the most creative photographers working today, devoted entirely to women who are reinventing American photography. Please join us again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, New York, which would be, um, I guess that's uh, 5 p.m. in Rome, for our last interview in the series. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Laurie Nix and Kathleen Gerber. Laurie and Kathleen are a force of nature. The city, <laughs> yes, yes, wait till you hear. They are a force of nature. The, the city, the portfolio we'll be looking at today consists of meticulously detailed dioramas that they construct over the course of months and then photograph. The photographs are rich, complex, and repay close study, creating a most unusual combination of humor and apocalypse. We can only scratch the surface in today's interview. So I hope that all of you will um, feel free to um, engage in a lively Q&A afterwards. Originally from the American Midwest, Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber have been making art together for about 20 years. Their work has gained acclaim in the US and Europe and Laurie is a 2014 Guggenheim Fellow in Photography. Recent solo exhibitions include venues in Germany, Italy, Canada, and the United States. They are represented by Clampart in New York City and Pachi Contemporary in Brescia, among others. So uh, welcome, Laurie and Kathleen. Um, maybe Hello. we can switch the screen over to you. Should we go right into our slides? Well, um, or do you want to wait a while? Yeah, well, actually, let's get started with the first one. Um, I'd like to see Chinese takeout with you. Or the first, no, the first one, no, I'm sorry. The first one is going to be the beauty salon. Oh, no, this is the first one that we, that we thought. Oh, that's the first, okay, well, that's good. Is this good enough, or do you want me to get uh, a beauty? Uh, that's uh, that's very good. Um, so um, this is Chinese takeout, and um, um, just to orient people, I understand this is from a diorama you constructed that's eight feet long by two, and uh, the photographs come in various sizes. Um, so um, you know we can get into the details more, but first, um, let's um, just uh, talk about what we're looking at, what, what are you doing here? So this is a diorama that Kathleen and I built and it was based on the little um, Chinese takeout restaurant right around the corner from our apartment in Brooklyn. And uh, what Kathleen is doing is she's adding um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of dirt and grime to, to the scene. Yeah, so this is very, uh, this is right near the sort of end of the uh, making. We would have a roof that would that would come on, um, but we probably had a couple months of building all of the elements leading up to this point. We kind of put it together and then I tend to go about adding all the sort of grime, dirt, washes just to age it and really make it look terrible. Yes. In a good way. <laughs> <laughs> well goal goal accomplished it looks terrible uh, <laughs> and wonderful and wonderful so um now here you are um showing us how you make it now um of course what you exhibit in your um in your in your many shows um uh, are not the process photographs but the uh but the finished photograph itself so maybe at this point you can take us yeah there we go so we just saw it in the process, in process, and now we're looking at the finished product. So uh, I think it helps people understand the scale of what we're looking at. You know, if you didn't know, you might think it, you know, is really, uh, you know, uh, just a photograph of a place uh, without, without realizing uh, what's involved. Um, so uh, maybe we could start by talking about your collaboration. Um, um, you've been working together for um, almost 20 years. Uh, could you talk about how you got started and the background 
or backgrounds that you bring to your work? Sure, sure. Um, uh, I met Kathleen in probably 1996. We were working together at an art production company and she was my boss. You could argue I still am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we sort of knew each other there. Uh, you were out of school, I was out of, out of school. And in school, I studied photography, ceramics, and woodworking. And I studied glass blowing and sculpture. And um, somehow we decided that our, our skills kind of combine well together. They, they mesh very well. And we started making dioramas. Lori moved, or we moved to New York in uh, 1999. Uh, I was burned out. You had just gotten a little grant, so we moved. And uh, we had day jobs. Uh, you worked in a photo lab. I worked at basically data, data entry somewhere. And um, we would get home from work, and Lori was continuing to work on a previous series, Accidentally Kansas. And so she was busy every night and happy making stuff and I had nothing to do and was bored. And I asked her if there was anything I could help her with. And she smiled and said, oh yeah. And- uh, Because I secretly knew that Kathleen had the talent. I had the vision, she's got the talent. So I like, ooh, she oh. encouraged her to help me. Yeah. Are you happy uh, you asked that question 20 years ago? <laughs> I think I am. I think I am. I had no particular miniature background, um, but but I did have the faux finishing background from the job where we met. And so that's where I sort of came in. Lori was still building the, the, the bulk of the set. And then I would come in and add little details and sort of after effects. Yeah, because even though, even though I studied art all through undergrad and graduate school, I never really learned how to draw. Like I can't draw. And I can do basic painting, but she's the one who brings what I what I consider she brings these scenes alive by her attention to detail, her washes, her grime, um, definitely her her sculpting abilities. Well, yeah. let's talk about some of those details. Uh, can you point out things uh, in this photograph that you'd like well, us to um, to be aware of? The main thing in this one is so you have the the menu boards, which are typically in all of these restaurants, but we made every little plate of food in miniature and then Lori photographed it and then compiled these these scenes yeah, or these uh, images here, the signage, uh, rather than just uh, uh, you know grabbing images from the internet. I, we idiotically made them all separate. Not, not idiotically, we couldn't <laughs> find consistent images to grab from say Google. And Kathleen was a little hesitant to even wanting to do this particular scene because this was not her favorite restaurant in the neighborhood. But once she realized that she would have to make tiny plates of food, that's when she came alive. Because what, isn't that one of your most fun things I to do? I do like tiny food. Yeah. So, so, oh, so she well, made all this yummy food <laughs> out of, out of, you know, clay, polymer clay and paint and, uh, paper and some cat hair thrown in there by accident. So, yeah. Uh, I see, okay, <laughs> well, I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> let's, well, let's, let's move on to the next. Uh, do you have the beauty salon? I do. Okay, so, um, so this is beauty salon and uh, wh when is that 2013, something like that? Oh, I think it might even be older. I think it, I'd have to look, but I'm guessing it's probably like 2000, 10, 2011. I see. Well, um, you know, this takes on particular resonance in days of COVID. I think we would <laughs> be, go to basically any place, any barber shop or beauty salon. Uh, this one is quite uh, unusual, though. Um, uh, what, what can you tell us about uh, this? How you came to it? And this this particular beauty salon is reminiscent of the one my mom used to take me to when I was when I was a child, I was, I was the, the last child left at home. So she would take me on all of her errands. And once a week, she would go to the little beauty salon in our very small, tiny town in Kansas. And um, I'd spend the afternoon there and she'd get her hair frosted and set. So I wanted to kind of like do a hark back to my, to my small town upbringing and, and create this beauty shop. 
love that. So, um, so yeah, so this is one of the smaller ones. It's probably about two feet deep, about a foot and a half wide. Um, but yeah, luckily you remembered all the little details from your trips there. Yeah. Oh. And uh, Kathleen had fun. I mean, she made, she like um, made all of the uh, hair dryer and curling irons and um, perfume bottles and shampoo bottles. So, and we always try to put enough detail. So, you know, these are, these are printed large so that if you spend some time looking at it, you'll find little, little fun things. So on this one, there's a little, uh, like a little aerosol can with a little, um, it's a little label is a little beehive hairdo. Um, where I was working, we sold gilding products. So I actually gilded that, that mirror that's on the back wall. So sort of, you know, so you can see more of what the scene is happening there. Um, so it's a lot of that little stuff is what keeps it uh, pretty interesting for us. Yeah. And well, afterward, oh, you want me to keep talking? Oh, no, 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 go ahead. I've, I've, I've got lots of questions. Go ahead. Okay. Well, after we're, maybe this is a little too premature, but after we're done shooting a scene, we normally take these apart, um, recycle what we can and throw them away. And this is the only scene that still remains intact because it's small enough that we can keep it in the studio. Um, it's packed in a crate, ready to go. When and well, if um, Lori and uh, Kathleen, can you do me a favor? Uh, tell me where your trash can is located. Huh. Our trash can <laughs> is, the, is the sidewalks, <laughs> sidewalks of Brooklyn. So okay, we would- Okay, I'll be there, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. um, it's, it's really extraordinary to think that you put all of this labor uh, into the diorama and then you throw it out. So the product is the photograph the product uh, with, this, with this exception, this one, which you've saved. Um, how long does it take you to make a diorama? Anywhere from three months to 15 months. Seven months is usually the, the average of what it takes to build and build and photograph. So um, yeah, rare, rarely is it less than three months. Yeah, I'm guessing this was probably four to five months. And this is, again, working uh, evenings and weekends mm -hmm. because we had full-time jobs during this. And sometimes we work on two dioramas at once, so which also extends how long it takes to do them. But um, it just seemed like whenever we were working on these scenes, we could work on a large scene, meaning expansive wise, and then a small scene at the same time, like a singular room. So um, usually we had two going at any any one time. Yes. Yeah, so well, why why do you throw out the diorama? Well, um, apartment living in New York is is very small and crowded. So to sit with I've counted ninety nine dioramas and images over the years. That's a lot of um, that's a lot of. Uh, we would be truly hoarders at yeah. that point. <laughs> and they're not, they're, this is the only one that is like a nice, neat, compact thing. Everything else is a flat sheet that's been painted, treated to be the ceiling, one for the floor. And so it's, it's, it's just, a, it would be a lot of just pieces and parts um, that wouldn't really make sense. You couldn't really enjoy having them around. You just have to pack them strictly for storage. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you recycle any elements from your dioramas? We try to recycle the floors and the ceilings and turn them into something else. Um, the rest of the stuff is so specific to the diorama. We rarely get to recycle any of the singular objects, but there was an office chair that made its way into, I believe, three different dioramas if you knew how to look for it. Yeah. And then it died. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I think, yeah, it's like whatever we think would be in a way generic enough that we could re reuse it. So probably uh, it would be something like that mirror, just sort of random bottles, things that would kind of just be filler in other scenes and not really focal points. Oh, you're going to frustrate so many future historians when they're looking for the diorama. Uh, they're wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm hoping maybe a museum will become interested or a collector. Um, they're, they're just wonderful. Um, the trick is we would have to know ahead of time. Exactly. You know, uh, so that we, we could preserve it. Or, right. Or know to at least save it temporarily to know if someone's interested. 
Um, and you know, that people don't really seem to work that way. Everything is last minute. And if someone is just learning about this now, well, this is 10 years old, 15 years old. So there's really no way, um, you know, unless someone has an empty barn that yeah. they would like to share with us or a, a, an attic and a free truck ride there, yeah. you know, not gonna then happen. we could talk. <laughs> I see. Well, uh, I think we have a view of uh, this under production. So that kind of gives you a sense of scale. This is one of this is the smallest diorama that we worked on. Um, others have been uh, quite a bit larger. So um, and we always like to show the scale that we're working if, if possible, because everyone thinks that because we work in miniature, they're always tiny. But that's not always the case. Some some end up being quite large. <laughs> And a lot of times people want to know if, if we work at a certain scale or at a certain size. Um, we're probably a little inefficient in that it's it's always a little bit a little bit different. Um, it just kind of depends whatever the scene needs. Uh, this one, because it's small, some of the elements could be a little larger. If we're going to some, if we're going to a larger scene, maybe library, mall, where it, we're trying to show a larger space, then those elements have to be smaller just so we're not overrun by the whole scene. Yes, or it could be, um, um, you know, the natural size and you just have very large hands. Uh, you know. Show your hands to the audience. Yeah. Uh, no one uh, wants this larger. Yeah. It's, uh... we're, we're moving into Jonathan <laughs> Swift territory. Um, one giant hand. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, um, I, I think that having this shot of your process is really interesting. And, and for me, at any rate, it underscores the wit, which is, um, uh, I think, an important part of your um, uh, important part of your work. Well, let, let's go on to the uh, next uh, picture. And I think people will notice if they're not already familiar with your work, that there is definitely a theme going on. Um, now, I understand that um, growing up in the Midwest gave you a connoisseur's knowledge of natural disaster with tornadoes and so forth. And then, uh, then you subsequently moved to New York City, which also has its own distinct catalog of disasters. Yes. So I'm wondering how those experiences um, in the Midwest and then moving to New York um, affected your vision and the way you um, create your, your art. What is this obsession with disaster? Well, it's true. I, um, I was born and lived the first uh, 10 years of my life in rural Western Kansas. So every season there was a new quote unquote disaster or uh, mother nature incident. So I've been through several tornadoes. I've been in blizzards and insect infestations and floods. And um, as a child, it was always an exciting event, you know, because it was outside of the norm where whenever there was um, say a giant hailstorm, we'd all go outside and either eat the ice or, or make snowballs and throw them at each other. Or if we came across, say, um, a, a, a pond frozen early in the season where you'd find a bunch of frogs frozen in the ice, I just remember chipping them out and throwing them at my sister. Uh, so my ideas as a child of danger disaster was always something new and exciting. My parents worried about the safety of the family, but us kids, we just like, you know, had fun playing in the tornado debris or um, ice storms. Yeah, I didn't have it quite like that, nope. but I enjoy Lori's <laughs> stories. <laughs> Glad I did not get a frozen frog thrown at me. <laughs> so yeah, and also um, I'm old enough, I'm 51. So my earliest recollections of cinema of Hollywood were disaster, was disaster flicks. I remember watching Towering Inferno, which was a movie about a giant skyscraper catching on fire and you know trying to save the people. Um, Planet of the Apes, which has its own uh, post-apocalyptic vision. Um, what else Logan do we want? Run. Um, Airport 76, so 77, 78, 79. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like my introduction to movies was always like disaster and people overcoming it. So um, that's just always been play, uh, has played out in the type of work that I enjoy producing in the studio. Well, what are we looking at here? 
This is a casino and we gave the casino an Egyptian theme uh, so we can actually play on time. So it's kind of the future, but the casino still harks back to the glory days of ancient Egypt. So there's that, that tension in, um, in, in the timeline to begin with. And um, it's your, and this isn't like a fancy Vegas casino. This would be more like a Reno, Nevada type casino or the Cincinnati, Ohio type casino. And then also just the whole idea that casinos uh, want to disguise the passage of time. They don't, they don't want you to know that time is going by. They want it to be sort of a timeless experience and you spend as much time there. Putting as, money in the machines. Right, put as much time there as, as possible. So, so that time is sort of frozen. And then here it's been, there's like a rift in time. And, <laughs> I don't know. But, but, you know, when we make these scenes, we have to have a lot of fun to do it. Because if you're going to be spending seven months doing it, there's got to be some some humor in it. And Kathleen was off at the side table working on something. And I look over her shoulder and she had made an, a tiny little old person's walker. Because we know that retired people like to spend their retirement savings at the local casino. So she made a little walker. And then she put a tiny little tennis ball on it just because you've seen so many of those walkers with tennis balls and the people like hobbling down the street. And it just made me just, just die laughing. Can you put your cursor on so they can see where the walker is? See that yeah. right? Yeah, so there's our walker. There's the little tennis ball. And this was several years ago, but I can only imagine that some of those hieroglyphs have a certain meaning as well. <laughs> like <it's> probably <laughs> little cartoon messages in those too. Yeah. Um, and a, another photographer in New York knew we were working on this and knew that we throw the scenes away. So as soon as we dismantled that, he immediately came out and grabbed these, these figures out of the trash can because he might need them for his own work later in the whatever he was working on so those were, did go to another artist home okay so the disguise worked i'm glad to, <laughs> it did. It did. to show that <laughs> um yes well uh that's really interesting what you say about time because i think there is something in your work which looks back and forward at the same time because this whole idea of the diorama is very 19th century with Daguerre and so forth and the references to Egyptian and then at the same time it's uh, it's very contemporary. Um, actually um, let, let's move on to the next. I um, do have a question about that because um, here we see another um, disaster scenario and um, you know when I think about the history of art, uh, there's so many names that come up uh, of artists who have dealt with apocaly apocalyptic themes going back uh, centuries, or if not millennia, and yet yours could never be mistaken for anybody else's. Um, so what are you bringing to the theme um, of apocalypse that is different and unique to you? I think our apocalypse, I think the stuff that we're doing, creating, allows the viewers to place themselves right here, standing in this particular shoe store and seeing exactly um, what's in front of their eyes. So we do play with the timeline quite a bit, but we still keep the viewer front and center. And we make these, we print these images quite large so that when you're standing in front of them, you can actually almost enter the scenes. Yeah. And then I think, I think humor, I think always trying to have it not be like an, an overwhelmingly terrible like experience um, is, is something that we try to do. Uh, you know, I don't know if this one is the perfect example of that, but if you think back to like beauty shop, you know, having that little beehive thing and, and others, maybe it's it's the like name of a magazine or it's it's just other little elements that just sort of make you stop and smile and just like okay well maybe it's not so terrible um that you just can't laugh a little bit yeah and we don't really address um disasters that are of the moment people have always people have asked us are you ever going to do a scene about 9 11 are you ever going to do a scene about the tsunami the tsunami uh 
and the um, earthquake off of Japan. It's like, no, we don't want to be that topical. We don't want people to think about um, contemporary disasters. That's too traumatic for, for many. So um, ours always hint at disasters. And we leave these narratives open-ended. We're not telling you what exactly happened. We're just showing you the aftermath. So, you know, you could say, oh, a tornado came through here or, oh, an earthquake came through here. But um, it's, it's not so specifically determined what exactly has happened. Yes, um, well, I like that a lot. So uh, by not defining it, you let people enter into the world and uh, write their own narrative or imagine their, their own story. And um, I think it's also important when you talk about uh, not referencing a specific disaster um, because there's nothing in your work that belittles people's tragedy. Um, um, it's, it's, um, I think it operates on a, on a different level. It's um, you know, just a, a, an exploration of disaster, but done in this humorous vein, which is so, I think it's so unusual and so successful to put them two together, to put the two of those things together. Um, kind of uh, in a way that uh, tragedy can enhance uh, comedy and, and vice versa, they, they bounce off each other. Um, so um, yeah, well, um, so uh, how many shoes? You wouldn't believe it, but over a hundred. It doesn't look like it, but I counted it before they were installed in the walls. Yeah, it was a lot of shoes and- um, And they're futuristic shoes. None, right. of, them, none of them have- um, there's no shoelaces on there. Um, mainly I couldn't figure out how to do them in, in mass and have them look look good and stay on long enough. And um, so, yeah. yeah, we just opted for the slip on. And they're all men's shoes. So, you know, men, men get to wear bright colors. Um, Let's see. So no the um, Amalda Marcos. No, 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 no. Um, no, no, no. Um, no Carrie Bradshaw. Well, oh yeah, Carrie Bradshaw too. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, I believe you have um, the New York subway. Yes, this one was fun. This one is definitely eight feet long and about two feet wide. And for Kathleen and I to do our research, um, I don't know if it's actually true or more of an urban myth, but you're not supposed to photograph uh, on, on subways, on, on public transportation. So we waited till about 11 o'clock at night when we knew that this line was going to end its run for the night. And we rode it to the end of the line into Brighton Beach. And as soon as everyone disembarked from the subway, we got out the camera, we got out the tape measure, a sketchbook. And I started photographing all the aspects of the car because, you know, this is the subway that we would ride every day to work, but it was always full of people. So to get it completely empty was very important. And I have pictures of Kathleen standing in the doorway with her arms extended so we could get the scale just right. Because if we had messed this up, we would have so many New Yorkers telling us that we got it all wrong. So we didn't want to hear, we didn't want to have that conversation. <laughs> I mean, the scale is still a little off. The like brushed metal stripes on the walls are a little out of scale, but you also have to work with the materials available to you at the time. So I think at first glance, it is believable though, as like a real space. And we do, we do always shoot for that. We don't expect you to hold that belief forever, but if it makes you stop and maybe look a little bit closer and then you see the more obvious modely things, maybe a little bit of glue somewhere, that's perfect. That's, you know, we, we, don't, we don't mind if you do figure out that it is not a real, real space, but we do want to slow you down yeah. in, in discovering that. Yeah. I see. Well, it still looks better than some other rides that I took <laughs> in the subway. So I kind of um, wish this was a scratch and sniff type of, of image where you could actually smell the subway as while you're looking at it. It'd be fun to introduce smell to some of our no. work, but she says no. no. Well, oh, <laughs> no. well, well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe, maybe. Um, well, let's um let's look at uh, the next. So um, all of these uh, that we're looking at today belong to your series, The City. Um, 
uh, how long have you been working on that and how many photos have you made of, of the city? Ooh, I forgot to count how many we made, but we worked on it for 10 years, maybe actually 12 years. We did our first one in 2005 and we probably finished our last scene in 2017 would be my guess. So it's a long time. Um, we like to do grandiose spaces. This is called map room. So this would be uh, you know, a, a museum type experience. So we do places of high culture and then low culture. Um, this one was 15 months in the making. And again, getting trying to get Kathleen excited about it. She hand drew each of these maps on the wall. Oh, and in order to do this, I would like buy her a, a couple of books on the history of map making so that she would have reference at her fingertips. And then she would just start drawing whatever she wanted. Yeah, so we had a sort of a general theme. So everything, um, Everything really low, use the cursor here, uh, is sort of uh, land based. So all of these little plaques are low relief, and it's all like animals and plant samples. And then we have the maps in this middle region. And then everything in the uh, molding along here is everything that's sort of um, astral space, whether it's a a planet surface or an explorer or a math equation is in there here and there. And then up at the very top, uh, Lori, Lori made up some constellations. That don't exist. Uh, there's not an armadillo constellation, no. nor a camel, nor a butterfly that we know of, you know, yes. we, we could be wrong. Um, but I think this was one of the more fun just because there was a lot of research and a lot of diversity that we could bring to it um the little archway above and back here uh it's it a used dragon. To, yeah i used to be on on old 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 maps when they didn't know what was beyond the islands they would have you know there be there be dragons here or something so this is our little nod to that uh so i mean that was this was a lot of fun so much work but um it was really good it's yeah. really good yeah well, I think this is a, a wonderful example also of how close study of your work uh, pays back uh, richly. Uh, I mean, looking at those constellations, uh, <laughs> it's just so imaginative. And so again, you're, you're letting the viewer in and, and bringing in all of the humor, or just uh, multiple layers of it. Um, so um, uh, yeah, and, and this one would be about what size, the original? Di uh, diorama. I'm guessing this is probably 60 inches long and probably 40 inches deep. All these scenes you need a lot of, you need a lot of floor because the camera just chews up the, the foreground. So they're always a little deeper. And then I'm shooting with a, a wide angle lens onto eight by 10 film and my camera is almost inside of this scenery and um, trying to capture as much as we as we possibly can. Um, this well, is a um, tall one. This is about three feet tall as, as well. And there's uh, little rods or something holding up the um, the uh, roof because this whole roof, uh, it just it just sits on the walls. It's not attached in any way. Yeah. And if I recall, I think I had about 12 or 14 um, strobes lighting this particular scene because the way that I approach lighting is I, I approach it very three-dimensional. I'm trying to sculpt the light and um, create this lighting that hopefully looks as natural as possible even though you're using these like harsh strobes. So um, there's a lot of um, uh, lights with um, spots and strobes and umbrellas all kind of like parked around this particular scene. Yeah. Well, the, the light in all of these images is exquisite. Oh, thank um, you. Let's yeah. go from a library to a mall. <laughs> 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 well, oh, my now, God. So, you know, you call it the city, but of course, it's not a specific city, no. No. Um, and nor is it a specific scenario. So uh, tell us about the mall. Um, this mall, I actually used to visit when I lived in Columbus, Ohio, and that's where Kathleen and I met. So she's been to the same mall as well. 
And when I was thinking about re like doing this mall scene, I, I called up a friend in Columbus and I said, hey, I want to go to the city center and do a little research, research. And she says, oh, honey, that place has already been raised. That's a public park now. So I'm always, you know, I'm not surprised that malls lose their, lose their appeal. But this one was a high end mall in the middle of downtown Columbus. But um, yeah, no more. So instead, we had to kind of create this mall out of out of memory. And this is one of the largest dioramas that we created. It's 10 feet wide and, and nine feet deep because it's a three story mall. So it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And if you were um, standing in it, you would be five inches tall, six inches tall. And that's how we kind of scaled this whole this whole scene. And the people are gone and nature takes over. Right. Yes. Um, and we don't, you know, we can't, we don't know if the people left overnight or again, if it was like a long, slow drawdown. But when these buildings sit for long periods of time, you know, they start, the, the paint starts peeling, the pipes burst and start um, creating water damage. And hopefully the flora and fauna just kind of like take over and, you know, woohoo, having a great time. Yeah, well, um, so you have this diorama. Um, how many photos will you take of a diorama and how many make the final cut for exhibition? This one was probably the most difficult one for me to photograph. I remember shooting 30 pieces of film and um, and eight by two, so that's, that's like, 15 different attempts to get exactly what I wanted, uh, which, you know, 30 is a lot, is a lot of film to go through. Usually I like to do it, um, if I'm having a really good um, feel about the scene, I can get it in six pieces of film, like three attempts to get what I want. Uh, and I think this one was difficult for us because the scene was just so gargantuan. The, the blue light that you see in the sky, that's actually our ceiling painted blue and light and lit from above. And um, just trying to get all the elements to come together. Plus, we also had two cats at the time. And when we'd come home from work, we'd find them like kind of like hanging out in the middle of these things because they think they're back in, in nature, but they're not because the plants that you see are all paper or plastic. Um, nothing in there is is real. When we do build them, um, we have or Lori has the the viewpoint already figured out. So we do build for one specific angle. It's not that we build these and then she spends time looking looking around trying to find the best setup. It's like we know kind of how we want the angle of the walls. Uh, what the sort of height of the camera is going to be. Um, so, you, so you do have that going in. And I think that's sort of how you sort of, that's your starting point, right? Yeah. If the camera moves, it's only moving an inch at a time, not much more than that. So the difficulty comes about really getting it lit just the way I want it lit. Yeah. I see. And then the result would be um, um, one master photograph. One master. So uh, I keep, yeah, I keep two pieces of film. I have my master piece of film and then my backup piece of film. And then everything else I shred once, uh, once I decide the image that I like. I see. Um, so um, for most of them, there is that one definitive view. And um, I think we're going to look at a little bit of an exception. Um, if you can show us the next slide. Uh, now this one, uh, you took uh, a nighttime and a daytime view. Uh, so we'll be looking at the daytime in a bit, but uh, here's the nighttime of uh, my favorite laundromat. Can you um, <laughs> tell us about this? Well, I don't know if everyone knows this, but New York is ubiquitous for having a rat problem at night. So we, um, we originally thought that this scene was just going to be a daytime scene, but I fell in love with these little fluorescent lights that we have that's, that's, that's lighting the entire scene. Because I've spent 
too many Friday and Saturday nights in the laundromat under these horrible fluorescent lights rather than being out and having fun with friends. So I wanted to bring that kind of desolate feeling into this particular image. And just sort of playing on, you know, most laundromats are pretty similar. Uh, there's not a lot of variation. So we just tried to make uh, sort of the typical average, you know, everyone's been to some version of this place, uh, a little bit older, a uh, little bit, you know, shows some of the um, personality of of like whoever owns it. I think there's like bowling pictures and a little <laughs> trophy like, in there. Yeah, there's like bowling team pictures because, you know, the laundromat might sponsor a bowling team. So that's it. that. Yeah. And then the, the, the big wall graphic is a, a, a picture from Prospect Park that we just kind of glued onto the, onto the fake paneling. A um, uh, friend made the uh, washers for us. And it's just, you know, it just turned out to be one of those that really came together well. And then as Lori said, I think we were setting it up one time and she would shoot at night so she could totally control all of the lighting. She just happened to see it before she turned on everything else. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and um, so we kept everything exactly the same, uh, except there's a little sock uh, board for all the little stray socks here on the right. So we kept that or just knocked that down. And then I made a, a, a few little rats. And this guy, it's hard to tell here, but we have fiber optics in for his for his eyes. So I'm actually on the other side of this wall with a flashlight um, shining. shining it on these fiber optics, trying to get the catch light effect um, for this scene. Kind of like when you're driving down the road and you see a deer in the road or an animal and their eyes are glowing because like the, you know, the, the headlights are hitting their eyes. So this rat is, you know, they're looking at you and you're looking at him. So it's that that whole same recognition that's going on. I see. And I love the way you do have that picture of, of the park on the left because it it kind of rhymes with the um, uh, mall we were looking at a moment <laughs> ago with actual nature, though it's simulated <laughs> coming in and now it's a, a photo of nature. Well, let's see what it looks like in daytime. All right, let's see if I can, I think it's, there it is on daytime. Yeah. There we go, yeah. And so like the only thing that, that we didn't fabricate for this scene is that cactus in the back of the wall. We got that at the Botanic Garden up the street from where we live. Everything else is- has and, been, well, and then the uh, lights. Yeah, and the lights. And everything else has been created by Kathleen and I and our friend Dan at the time. So, yeah. Yes, well, um, so let's, um, let's see the uh, library. This happens to be everyone's favorite image. This resonates with so many people. Um, we still get um, emails about it, and uh, that that makes that makes me very happy. Yeah, sadly there are none available. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, again, sometimes people want to know where is this, where where is this? But uh, as we touched on, we don't really try to reproduce any one particular place short of the of the Chinese Chinese takeout or subway or the uh, subway so this we uh, once Lori had the idea to do a library we just kind of did some internet research looked at a lot of uh, older a lot of European libraries to look at the elements that we liked you know what did we like about it? was it the, the like roof height was it how the space was laid out and for this, we really like this sort of stair step out towards the viewer. Mm -hmm. And um, for me growing up, my little small town library had these um, display cases or vitrines and mine happened to be full of exotic eggs. And I just remember being like a small kid, my nose pressed to the glass, looking at these beautiful ostrich eggs and quail eggs and just like enamored. So we wanted to bring that same, um, wonder to these display cabinets in the in, in the back of the walls so yeah so this bigger one here on the left is a uh, my version of a cormorant and then these are bluebirds as i was thinking of like the bluebirds of 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 happiness uh, but then just to sort of mess with you a little there's some bluebirds that are loose out in the uh scene here and then there's one there's and then one. there's one yeah so so yes, we like, we like to definitely have a little fun. 
Yeah. So um, there's a there's a wealth of uh, detail and imagination here with the things you've put on the wall, the, the pictures, and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, your choice of um, decorating this library. More about the cases and the and the framed pictures. Oh sure. Um, what's interesting about this is um, it took me an entire summer just to create the books. Each of these books are hand carved out of um, pink or purple foam, the kind of stuff that we can buy at the local hardware store. So each one has been cut and sanded, and then we've painted them in traditional uh, book binding colors of like uh, blues and greens and, and golds. And Kathleen did a little bit of gilding on some of them to kind of bring up, the, sometimes you see gold across their spines. And um, what else? Some of the photos again are, reminiscent of people that we know or ideas. I grew up in rural Kansas and this is a, 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 a literary uh, historical figure. This is um, Carrie Nation. She was totally against drinking um, and was a big prohibition um, rights, you know, activist. In fact, she would she would like go around and chopping people with their axes if like she caught you drinking. So she was like a little on the woo -woo side. <laughs> so you know we have we have a picture of her up on the wall, and um, I think we have a couple of other celebrities that I just can't think of at the moment. Sorry, this one is a little more fuzzy in my mind. Yeah. Well, yeah. definitely <laughs> we created a world here, and uh, we can move uh, from the library to the theater. Oh, theater. Yeah, this one um, was probably one of the first monumental ones that we that we tackled. So we did this, I think, in 2006. And we didn't feel like making a piano. So we bought this. This is a, a music box that Kathleen has then added some some weathering to. And this piano sets the scale for everything else that we make in the scene. And um, once we had the, the piano in place, we asked our friend Dan to if he would like to make us a couple of chandeliers. And you know, the only um, information we gave him is we need this one to be about the size of a softball. So he goes home to his to his apartment and started working. And I believe like six months later, he shows up with uh, these beautiful chandeliers that he made out of beads and twisted wire. And they actually function, they actually light up, which you can kind of see up in the up in the corners. Oops. Sorry, guys. Oops. Well, do you have a night view of that one? No, not at this one, because the lights are so dim, they wouldn't even really show up. I see. And then on the right is the sign, which is uh, come down the majestic. Yes. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, play in your images with signage and ironic commentary. Uh, can you can you talk about that? Um, well, yeah, it's like so. If you think about it, this, this is like a majestic theater, and it's not looking so majestic any longer, and it has a. Uh, it has a, a very large family of, of crows decided to build their nest in the in the giant um, the uh, big chandelier. There yeah, it's full of a middle. giant bird's nest. And so they're like flying around. And this is all shot practically. You know, this is still this is still um, shot on film. So, you know, we had to like make these birds fly without um, just digitally putting them inside. So they're actually placed on um, very small hardened wire that come out to so that they're the wires hidden behind their behind their bodies and um what else do you want to say about this yeah and in terms of the signage i think that is something that that, that we do kind of pay attention to um and we do like that sort of ironic nature you know the sort of fall of the majestic space it's also the like name of many of many theaters and it's also um that name, it's not just specific to New York City. It's, you know, every town had a majestic theater, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> at one point or another, even if it only, you know, seated 45 people, it was the majestic. Yeah. And so just sort of, yeah, playing with people's stereotypes with that. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, as I look at these images, it strikes me that uh, there's a certain informality to them. 
uh, but at the same time, nothing is arbitrary, if that makes sense. So this uh, the placement of the signage would be a case in point. Uh, and if people are able to go back and look at your uh, website, uh, they can uh, study these, or even better, see exhibition of your work, uh, they can study the details and uh, things begin to cohere in a very uh, uh, wonderful way. Uh, what, what is the name of your website? Oh, you can just um, laurienix.com uh, or laurienix.net is the That'll site. You there. And yeah. then also just um, Nick Gerber Studio. We'll get you there. That'll also get you there. Yeah. yeah. And if you have the press release, uh, that information is there as well. Um, so uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, the church. Oops. Why am I having trouble? There we go. Yeah. So I'm always amazed and just dumbfounded how churches lose their purpose. They like no longer are churches any longer and they become more sacrilegious spaces. Like I've actually been to a church that turned into a brewery and I'm sitting in the nave enjoying a very tasty cold beer. And I thought, well, this isn't right, but <laughs> this is where I'm at. And um, there was even a, a church in the middle of Manhattan that became a, a, a nightclub that was really popular back in the, the early eighties, the Lime Life. Now- I think it's a gym now. It, then it went to a pizza place and now it's a very fancy gym, you know? And it's in the middle of Manhattan and the people, there's still as many people as ever in Manhattan. So how did the church not stay a church? You know, where did the congregation go? That's just like always like, it, just, it still dumbfounds me. Um, so we wanted to kind of take that idea of this the interior, this amazing and majestic church that has has lost its congregation and instead it's become a kind of like a, a junkyard or holding place for um, signage that harks back to a different era in the United States. The era would be uh, Route 66, 1950s, 1960s America, which I'm still fascinated in. I love when I see the signage, I'm amazed that it's still you know standing where it is. And there are a couple of places across the United States where you can actually go in, into like sign museums and, and see these old fantastic uh, metal signs from a, a different era. So yeah, this let us really play with uh, designing the, the uh, different signs. We did take them from a lot of sort of designs that were already out there yet. Yeah, as Lori said, she likes to get books. So we got books on you know signs from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, I know personally, or we had talked a lot about just the sort of play on the word signs and, you know, you talk about people getting signs in religion or I got a message from God. And so, you know, just to sort of tweak that idea a little bit. Um, and then this has really kind of let us, uh, let us play with that a bit. Um, like there's some signs from my home, hometown, the like little like cleaners here sort of fun you got the l for laura you got the g for gerber um lots of uh lots of arrows like pointing up some pointing down again heaven and hell and then because we're midwesterners there's a big old ear of corn back here um just you know i tried to do a lot of different techniques sort of looking at things uh that way um and 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 when we work on these dioramas we kind of like split the work according to our skills so i am personally just concentrating on making the church walls the floor and the ceiling and so i'm i'm in charge of structure and kathleen is the one who did all of the signs so because i feel like she gets the more fun projects i did i did in this <laughs> one yeah well this is um it's interesting because um you know, um, we have uh, uh, people um, with us today from Rome, and it makes me think that uh, there, uh, the situation is almost the opposite. So there's kind of reverse relevance there, that other buildings are then turned into churches. Um, there's some very prominent examples like the, the uh, baths of Diocletian. Uh, one of the late Roman emperors uh, was transformed into a church, uh, the church of Santa Maria degli Angeli. Um, and there's, there's many others also in Italy. So it's, it's, uh, it's almost the, uh, you know, it's a topsy-turvy world. Um, <laughs> well, so we've got um, one more 
And then what I want to do after that is open it up to our audience so we get everybody involved. Let's see. Let's see which way. Oh, oh, oh go back. There. There we go. Nice. To yeah. Share yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not all of our scenes are like fun and uplifting. Um, <laughs> this is we consider this we call this control room and this came about because, you know, my day job, I worked at a photo lab and I would be processing um, and making contact sheets of other photographers work. And one photographer, his name is uh, Robert Polidori, was one of the very first photographers let in to photograph Chernobyl's aftermath. So he was able to go to Pripyat, go into the old um, nuclear uh, power plant and photograph. And um, I saw these contact sheets and they were just amazing because it was basically the only thing left in this place was just the metal cabinets. Somebody had already come through and taken, I, I think, helped themselves to all of the, the copper wiring and all of the, all of the, um, what are these things called? All of the dials and gauges. So they were just these like hulks of machines with holes in them. And it's one of those images that had always had struck me and I thought about it for years. And it's like, it was my time to work on my own control room. And the way we went about this was um, very simple materials. Like we're using the backs of earrings, we're using uh, googly eyes, um, uh, parts of necklaces to kind of create these round dials and uh, just, um, having as much fun as you can with a nuclear disaster. Well, and I think we were, uh, you know, thinking of, again, since it was based on sort of environmental pictures and the environment and, you know, we kind of have this illusion that we have control over our world and our place in it. And, you know, this was our sort of thing of like, guess what? We don't. And, you know, just sort of seeing the sort of aftermath of maybe that, that hubris, um, uh, just kind of a mess. Yeah, and you can just feel that that water's just radiated. It's just toxic and ready to just like, you know, ooze everywhere. But yeah. it's weirdly kind of pretty too. <laughs> the colors are nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I enjoy making rust as well as, food so uh got to play with that quite a bit um, <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you make the two together uh, <laughs> rusty food no 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 i, I took a small break <laughs> well we have been known to like you know lick our fingers with paint on them and you know we still get a little toxic in our own apart in our own studio oh. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, well, don't don't try it at home, as they say. Uh, yes. Well, so um, um, we're going to open this up to uh, questions, um, uh, Q and A from our audience, and so uh, everybody, please uh, feel free. Um, uh, now, let's see if you can, uh, if everybody in the audience is able to unmute and then also to put on their video so we can see you. And uh, if for some reason the audio is not working on your end, you can also type a question in the chat uh, so that um, uh, Laurie and Kathleen can answer you. And before we get started on that, I just wanna remind everybody that next week uh, at the same time, um, we are having our final presentation in this series. Uh, so if you have the press release, um, the link is there every, every week. It's a different link. I'm going to type my, actually in the chat, I'm going to type my email. If you want the press release and don't have it and you want the link, so um, be, uh, feel free to, to write me. So next week, uh, Melanie Walker, uh, will be speaking, and um, if you don't know her work already, uh, she is a poet, and I think that her work is so very moving. Uh, she will be uh, talking about um, the concept of home and presenting her work on um, the Househeads and uh, Nomadic Dreamer. Um, so now, I understand that uh, some of you are having trouble unmuting. Um, if our host 
Ricardo is able to unmute people. Uh, if that's not possible, please type um, a question into the chat and we can um, get that. And thank you very much. Uh, that was a just a wonderful, um, I, I love that so much. Okay, <laughs> the microphone should be on now. Um, so I think people should be able to unmute themselves. Would anybody like to give it a try? Natalia, I think you were trying to do that. Uh, yes, I only can't uh, have a video, but that's okay. I want to thank uh, Lori and Kathleen for their wonderful presentation. It's kind of mind bubbling when you look at uh, all the details. And I just looked like, for example, at the ma um, Metra picture, and there was a little sign on the wall, take a break from life. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just yeah. hilarious how <laughs> this little detail kind of changes everything. And of course, the beehive thing. And then with the shoes, like uh, with this reference to walk in my shoes, we are creating a certain theater of situations, a scenario in which you can walk in and then kind of Im imagine it. It kind of sent me back to different philosophical ideas like Jean-Paul Sartre and his theater of situations. And it's just like fascinating and mind bubbling the worlds that you create. And it just was a beautiful presentation and I'm grateful to get to know your work. And maybe some ideas because I've read a little bit uh, about your notions about resilience of nature and if you can a little bit elaborate about that, because there were these creatures and plants, and even in um, the last image of the nuclear control room, there's still mold coming from that cross that we bear on the ceiling, but there's still mold seeping in, kind of promising that nature will take over eventually. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, uh, regarding the sign in the Metro, yeah, that was a very in intentional uh, sort of uh, lighthearted message <laughs> like that. There are times where I will just start laughing as I'm making stuff and Lori's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is hilarious. And it's just, you know, um, and then, yeah, resilience, you know, it's, for all of Lori's love of the apocalypse, and I will say it's mainly Lori's love. I get too freaked out. Um, she's super optimistic. And so I think by having a little bit of nature growing back and seeing that uh, life is still present, life is still going to go on, it's gonna fight its way through that, you know, there is a little bit of uh, hope in that. And regardless of how messy, how crumbled, how disheveled things look, uh, you know, life will find a way. Maybe not human life. Yes, yeah, so maybe not human life. And, you know, if we disappear from this earth, who's, you know, no one's going to really miss us. Maybe some, some house, house cats and the dogs for a couple of months but you know they're they're going to be fine it's just there won't be anyone left here to miss us right right so yeah and we might be the most fragile of 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 animals on this planet at this point yeah thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. um there is a question of what we're working on now and in the future and um, we're still trying to get, figure out what we want to do next we're we're not going to be doing any more apocalyptic scenes because we're kind of living our own personal apocalypse right in the here and now uh, it's time for some more uh, a little more uplifting work I, I i'm not sure if it's in me to make uplifting work but i'm going to try so we don't have anything we have a couple of projects that we're working on but nothing that's really grabbed us yet we're still trying to figure things out, but still, still model, model based. Um, one avenue is still model and photo combined, but mm -hmm. maybe more object oriented in the in the in the end. More and, sculpture, right? And more like sculptural, even <gasps> installation. And you know, it's Fire. kind of tough because um, you know, 
it's interesting watching people react to standing in front of a photograph and then how they react standing in front of sculpture. And um, again, the viewer is the most important component to what we do. So if we did sculpture, and, I, and what I'm really saying is like, really it just boils down to just showing these models in person as opposed to a two dimensional space, letting them interact with the model, watching them like look into the crevices and in through windows and seeing what they see. So it might become a little more playful that direction. To be deep. And we'd probably work even slower, which is hard to imagine yeah. at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but that's like a, a, a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we have time for um, more questions. Anybody um, have a question? <laughs> Maybe we answered everything. <laughs> Any takers? Oh, well, there's so much to see in your work. Uh, an embarrassment of riches. Yes, I think people are signing on. Oh, yes, Paul. Hey, oh, hi, Bill. How, How are you doing? Hi. Oh, nice um, to see you. You, nice to see you too. Um, thank you both. These were wonderful images. Um, I wish I had a magnifying glass for my computer to see them in more detail. Um, but I have a question um, about your your process. It is model based, um, obviously. Um, can you discuss from your own perspective of the end result of the photograph, which is what you share with the world, um, how the, the model versus photoshopping comes across in the, the final image that for some of the textures, the colors, you might be able to Photoshop that as well. I understand from uh, the standpoint of just your personal process that it, it's not as much fun. I, um, it wouldn't be as collaborative, but from just the visual perspective, what's the advantage of the model versus the Photoshopping? So this particular series we shot all on film and I used to print these traditionally using the, you know, the color enlarger and paper. So there was like absolutely no Photoshopping. It was all darkroom tricks. And just knowing from enough about theaters, we have to make the colors a little bit more theatrical as we're, as we're working, knowing that the colors will then kind of um, be toned down when it comes to printing. So um, no Photoshop, um, heightened theatricality of the lighting and the colors. Um, I don't shoot film anymore. Now I actually shoot digitally. And um, believe it or not, for me, shooting digitally is, is actually harder than shooting film because now that everything is compiled on the computer, I want everything to be absolutely perfect. So when I was shooting these scenes, I started thinking about money and how much it was going to cost to keep shooting film because back then film was running about $12 a sheet. So now when I shoot digitally, I think about time. My time um, doesn't cost as much. So I will actually shoot these scenes again and again and again and again until they're absolutely perfect because my Photoshop skills are so uh, lacking and I want to get close to perfect as possible. And I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think, yeah, part of it is, is we just don't know the Photoshop in the same, in the same way. I'm just old fashioned. Uh, we're old fashioned and, and, and I guess we do feel that there, there is a difference that comes through, you know, if you, if you watch a movie where the effects are done practically versus CGI, um, whether or not it's obvious, and I don't have the eye to really notice everything, it to me it, it, it does feel different, you know. And yeah, there's maybe like more of a warmth to it. The like texture is a little bit different. The shadows can be a little bit different. Um, and I think we end up liking a lot of the happy happy accidents that that show up that you don't plan for. Um, whereas if we were trying to build everything in the computer through like Photoshop, you know, we have to think of it. And then it's, in my mind, it, I don't know how I would find some of those happy accents. Maybe, maybe they would be different, different versions. Um, again, computer illiterate. Um, so, um, 
but I think a lot of it's just looking looking for that sort of warmth and like textural differences. Yeah. And yeah. whenever whenever you're viewing an image, whenever it passes through a lens, it just changes. It just makes things even more even more magical. Probably mostly because you can't see the outside world when you're looking through the camera lens. You know, it's just like what the camera sees. And um, yeah, these things these 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 get infinitely more interesting um, once they pass through a lens than if you were to see them face to face. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, if I'm allowed to add on to that, that uh, for me, um, it's so wonderful to see the handwork. And I think that comes out very well in the photograph. Um, so there's a kind of warmth to that. And um, you, know, you feel the passage of the human hand, and this is an actual object. And that comes across in the dimensionality also. It's, uh, it doesn't look like it's constructed. Um, in a in a computer, um, and I think that really adds a lot Yay. to your work. Um, let me see. Some people are having problems with camera, but you can still uh, ask a question by um, uh, typing one in. Other, we were very fortunate to have uh, Laurie and Kathleen with us here today. There's a great opportunity. Take advantage of it if you have any. <laughs> <laughs> any questions because tomorrow they'll be working on a diorama probably so uh, you have oh, to wait actually, later, later today we got to go back to work yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Bill, any, um, may i make any, a question sorry for the video uh it was impossible for me to come back in this camera i don't know why um because the precision of the particulars i want to ask you to the two artists, if uh, when uh, they were uh, a baby, have <laughs> you ever uh, created a crib? Oh, a crib, no, mm -hmm. yeah. Only because we don't necessarily want babies in our scenes because, you know, if the baby's gone, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no, no babies, no, no dead house pets, uh, but, but People, people do wonder, you know, why, why are there not people? And, and there's a couple reasons. First of all, I say people are difficult to do um, and do and do well and not not just look like bad versions. Um, and then also people with their clothing that does pinpoint uh, time and in and, and place quite often. Uh, one thing that a friend brought up was with our, with our scenes is like, yes, you can't tell what happened, but you often can't tell when it happened. Like, did it happen yesterday? Did it happen 30 years ago? You know, 100, 100 years ago. And, and people in clothing would bring a specific time period to it and it would it would change it it would turn it more into a illust illustration versus an experience i think and then uh, um i want to be curious to know if you ever ever read because you are a uh, founder of a disaster have you ever read the um apocalypse, apocalypse of john mm -mm. Mm -mm. The apocalypse of giovanni from, uh, from, the, from the bible from the bible yes no 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 <laughs> the, uh, lots of disaster lots of monster inside <laughs> they, they've created their own bible oh hopefully it's an okay one <laughs> uh. well, thank you thank yeah. you i mean um this is such an interesting question uh that was asked and um you know about the absence of people um i wonder if having a person would also change the emotional register of your work i mean it certainly it works in with the idea of timelessness that you talked about but if you have a disaster scene with a person in it that changes it doesn't it yeah i'm afraid it might make it a little too real like um uh we don't want to cause anyone stress or distress from their own experiences that, that they've they've had and we don't want to downplay anyone's experience with um, unfortunate events. Uh, so that's why another reason why we don't necessarily want um, to represent 
humans. Yes. Yes. Or pets. Or pets. Or pets. Yes. House plants, yes. Pets, right. No. Wild animals, yeah. Yes. And a chicken, is that a pet? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, do we have other questions? Okay. Well, um, I, oh. I actually have a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, I go see ahead. someone else. Go ahead. go ahead. Who's going ahead? You go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I am. I'm Renny here from Italy, uh, no. and I enjoyed it a lot. And um, the absence of people leaves us uh, the possibility of imagining stories. Like yes. um, I, for one, was trying thinking. Who was dusting the globes in the map room? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a whole story to make up uh, there. I mean, obviously, it's the kind of room that I would love to spend most of my time in. So I was, I would be certainly dusting the globes there. <laughs> <laughs> I can see, like, you know, spin shining them all the way up. Yeah, because it, 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 was, it, was no, it was noticeable in the midst of all the, you know, the moss and all that. The globes. Well, around, and the dust just falls off. <laughs> Yeah, well, it does. It does. <laughs> and, and off the telescope too. So somebody's using the telescope, right? Yeah. And and it's that one thing that the library made me think of. Um, I don't know uh, how many people have seen it or would remember. Is the library in Sarajevo during the war? Oh, um, I remember that. Mm. Yeah, and when there was a concert. Our, our orchestra of the Scala went there with Zubin Mehta and, uh, and had held a concert there live. And that was what it made me think of, besides wanting to look at all the books, of course, which <laughs> is pulling them all out and seeing what's in them. But that was, that was, you give a lot of, you know, make up stories as one is watching, as just about looking at it, as one making up stories that go with them. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Also, we have, Bill, we have plenty of, Small churches that are deconsecrated <laughs> don't work as churches yeah, anymore. they are party venues and and um, the warehouses and that kind of thing. Small small ones. Uh, Amazing. Have, in, in my town, there's a, there's this one that was like all oh, this it was like eighth century and then ended up having uh, vats for for all sorts of things in it. I mean, built in it and underneath that are frescoes you know oh, so oh, okay. amazing amazing yeah okay. next next door to our studio here is a church that's uh not being used as a church and you know mm -hmm. i would love to ooh, make that my studio and all kathleen can say is looks cold looks cold okay thank you thank you uh is I think there was another uh, Yeah, I'm a, hi, um, my name is Alex um, and I live in New York. Um, I'm not camera ready this morning, but um, I'm a huge fan. I, I first saw your work uh, at Clamp Art. Um, Yay. Yeah, <laughs> a couple of years ago, I think it was the Empire exhibition. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my question, you, you, my fascination with your work is really the apocalyptic nature of all of your imagery. But you've answered most of those questions for me. So my uh, today, and so thank you for that. Um, but the question that I have remaining is really one about scale, and that is those images um the way that you printed them were so big mm -hmm. and my question is how do you decide how to go from what size to what size i mean this is really like a technical question how do you i mean they 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 were so big and you start from so small how do you how do you make that decision to to do that and 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 to you've you've answered the question of perspective and and the viewer's perspective and you've you've um uh there's so much technical information here that 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 you've addressed and that's my last that's my only question so um it's it's a two-pronged answer um for the city series uh i know we already want to make our images either 
30 by 40, 40 by whatever, or 48. So to me, that's like small, medium, and large. And intimate scenes like the beauty shop really only need to exist as smaller images. They could be the 30, 30 inch images. Whereas the map room, because it's a more grandiose space, we printed it as large as the printing paper would allow at the time, which is like 48 inches. So that's one way we determine how to um, figure out the size of the photographs that, we sh that we're going to print. And also, um, exhibitions come around every three or four years. And uh, in a good year, Kathy and I would finish three images and that's us just working nonstop. But in a more typical year, we might only do one, one and a half image. And we know that we have a, a big gallery space to fill. So we need to produce, and you know, usually we only have seven to 10 images to ever exhibit at once. And it's kind of like my need to fill the space, to, to fill the walls also contributed to the size of the prints that we were doing. Because, you know, for you to come into the gallery and only see seven images, I want them to be absolutely spectacular, both in uh, the amount of detail and also the size of the print. Right, because yeah. they, they, were, they were huge. They were <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of also a problem because um, now we have to kind of store all that huge work. So uh, uh, I don't always think that everything needs to be printed large and printed big. And like I'm telling people, don't do as I do, do as I say. You know, there's nothing wrong with images that just appear in a book or in very small and intimate um, ways. It just happens like I get size gets the better of me after I think about the amount of work that we've done to create an image that I always want to kind of like show off a little bit and make a big. Right. Which, and it's also very dramatic that you're going from from one scale to the to the other. Yes. And we already know that we're going to be making these images big. So the particular scene that you the, the work that you saw was all done digitally. And for us to actually um, create files big enough to print those big, we, we shot the scenes in, um, in grid patterns and then had Photoshop um, uh, combine them to make a, a large image file, which uh, I ended up spending more time at the computer than I really enjoy. And, um, you know, and I feel like these days I'm actually spending more time at the computer than at the, at the work table. So I thank God Kathleen is, uh, not having to, to, to do the computer work. So she gets to remain uh, working with her hands. So we already have an idea of how big the images need to be. And I make sure that I, I create either the, the large negative or the large digital file uh, to have on hand because you can always make things smaller but you can't necessarily make small go bigger. So um, just, just preparing for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for seeing the show. Oh yeah, it was amazing. It was really amazing. <laughs> Well, this is uh, Bill uh, Travis speaking again. I, I want to uh, thank everybody for a most stimulating, uh, I don't know if I should say morning or evening, it depends where you're tuning in from, uh, wonderful questions and um, a terrific presentation. Thank you so much, Kathleen and Lori and everybody for attending. Um, and, um, uh, and just as a reminder, uh, please uh, remember that uh, next week um, on Saturday is the final installation from this series with the uh, very special um, poetic work of Melanie Walker. So please come to that and tell your friends. Um, and uh, thank you very much. So I think I will um, uh, sign out now and thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.